Welcome to Understanding IEEE 802.11 AD Physical Layer and Measurement Challenges, sponsored by the IEEE and Agilent Technologies. In this tutorial, we hope to shed some light on the specific characteristics of the wireless LAN standard defined for the 60 GHz unlicensed band. We'll also attempt to illustrate some real signals using measurement examples. To do this, we have three speakers with extensive knowledge of wireless communications including 802.11 AD, and vast measurement expertise from Agilent Electronic Measurements Group. David Grieve, a master engineer and 60 gigahertz program lead. Bob Cutler, a lead technologist, both from EMG's technology leadership organization. And yours truly, John Harmon, a wireless application lead in the microwave communications division. Together, your three presenters represent 95 years of industry experience. Our agenda today will start out with an overview to build some context and scratch the surface of this wireless LAN standard, moving right into the five packet structure. To do so, we need to take a side trip to understand more about GOLE complementary sequences and their roles in the 802.11 AD standard. Along the way, we'll sprinkle in some real measurement examples to both illustrate concepts and to visualize what has been presented. Continuing on with the PHI, we will dive into the data field modulation schemes. For this, we'll present breakout sessions on some special cases of modulation schemes used in 802.11 AD and on LDPC, the error correction scheme used, with some examples to illustrate. And we'll finish up with a summary and some concluding remarks. This is a lot of material to cover, and will take a total of about two and a half hours. So for your convenience, we have divided it logically into six parts. So let's get started on part one. By now, everyone has heard of or experienced the tsunami of data in our world. Everything must be connected all the time to everyone. This vision drives the wireless LAN market, which includes but is not exclusive to 802.11 AD. While wireless LAN is being integrated into more consumer products, including smartphones, digital cameras, tablets, and entertainment products like HDTVs and Blu-ray players, there is a demand for higher rates and simultaneous connections. The growing trend of bring your own device to work places traumatic demands on enterprise infrastructure and raises the bar on system security and quality. An increasing number of cellular carriers are embracing Wi-Fi for data offload from their cellular networks. Data offloading can deliver up to 70% savings per byte. Carrier-grade devices and access points demand higher performance. The oversight of carriers distinguishes this from the consumer-grade devices through specific qualification processes for a given carrier network. Wireless displays and TVs, video streaming, Rapid file upload and download, and the transfer of streaming of large files all require significantly higher data rates. And new applications appear every day. Medical monitoring, smart meters, and other machine-to-machine -machine connections are the manifestation of the Internet of Things. Since its introduction in 1997, several amendments to the IEEE 802.11 standard for different physical layers have been introduced. This chart highlights the main amendments. 802.11a, b, g, n are in use today, along with 802.11j for Japan, and 802.11p for vehicular applications was approved in July 2010. But this presentation series is focused on 802.11ad specifically. So naturally, we must also focus on its core mission, delivery of very high throughput rates. To address this demand for higher rates, two new IEEE project groups aimed at providing very high throughput, or VHT, were established. Working Group TGAC aimed to specify 802.11ac as an extension of 802.11n, providing a minimum of 500 megabits per single link and 1 gigabit per second overall throughput, running in the 5 gigahertz band. Working Group TGAD selected from several proposals and proposed 802.11 AD, providing up to 7 gigabits per second throughput 
using approximately 2 GHz of spectrum at 60 GHz over short range. Bearing in mind the number of existing devices, backward compatibility with existing standards using the same frequency range is a must. The goal was for the 802.11 series of standards to be backward compatible and for 802.11 AC and AD to be compatible at the MAC layer or medium access control and differ only in physical layer characteristics. Let's take a short look at 802.11 AC. There are several ways to increase data throughput in an existing communication system. 802.11 AC utilizes three such aspects. First, an increase in bandwidth from 20 and 40 megahertz to 80 and 160 megahertz enables the higher data rates, certainly. However, it does require some design considerations, particularly in the implementation of digital predistortion. Second, a move to ever higher modulation order increases the number of bits per symbol and therefore occupies a more spectrum efficient place on the Shannon limit curve. 11AC increases the modulation scheme from 64 QAM to 256 QAM. Yet higher order modulation requires greater signal to noise ratio to preserve a given link budget. These gains do not come for free and must be paid with more linear hardware and better phase noise performance. And third, the employment of spatial streams using MIMO has a multiplicative effect on the Shannon rate. 11AC specifies up to eight potential spatial streams. Yet more antennas mean more complexity and capacity gains using MIMO techniques are invariably dependent upon the channel conditions. Still, all told, the system parameters combine to provide theoretical data rates of 6.9 gigabits per second, a remarkable speed for wireless. However, we must put on our practical hats and lower our expectations to what will most likely be much less, around 1.5 gigabits per second. The channelization of 802.11 AC illustrates leverage of the existing 5 gigahertz spectrum in channels. It also demonstrates the limited availability of wider channels. We can see that there are only two 160 megahertz wide channels available, and the second channel cannot be used if there are weather radars nearby. Thus, the 80 plus 80 megahertz mode allows more opportunities for 160 megahertz transmissions by combining two 80 megahertz channels that are not adjacent in frequency. Nevertheless, the rates stated for 11AC vary from 300 megabits per second to the top end of 6.9 gigabits per second deployed in two waves. Now let's look at 802.11 AD. 802.11 AD is a backwards compatible extension to the IEEE 802.11 2012 specification that extends the MAC and PHY definitions to support short range wireless data interchange over an ad hoc network at data rates up to 6.75 gigabits per second in the 60 gigahertz unlicensed band. It also supports session switching between the 2.4, 5, and 60 gigahertz bands. Since 1994, when the Federal Communications Commission first proposed to establish an unlicensed band in 59 to 64 gigahertz, radio regulatory organizations around the world have been legislating appropriate frequency allocations and modulation parameters to establish similar unlicensed bands in their respective jurisdictions. In the early 1960s, information was published about the unique absorption characteristics of higher frequency electromagnetic signals. 60 gigahertz is the absorption resonance of oxygen. This is a particularly attractive property for limiting propagation in secure applications. But it is also useful for reducing co-channel interference. Both of these properties are put to use for commercial 60 gigahertz. A channelization of the 57 to 66 gigahertz band has emerged by consensus from technical specification development work. In November 2011, this channelization and corresponding spectrum mass for the occupying signal was approved by the ITUR for global standardization, shown here. As the diagram illustrates, not all channels are available in all countries. Channel 2, which is globally available, is therefore the default channel for equipment operating in this frequency band. China is addressing this in the 43.5 to 47 gigahertz area. You will notice a frequency mass superimposed above the channels. Let's take a look at this. 
If you're familiar with other OFDM specifications, you will recognize this shape. But there are two aspects to note. The first, because 11AD uses both single carrier and OFDM modulation, the breakpoints at minus 25 dBr have been pushed out a bit to accommodate the rather more spread out spectrum of single carrier modulation. And second, even though the mask is approved by the ITU, it has been superseded by a subsequent draft and is now part of the release standard. The mask was relaxed further so that it could make the power amplifier designer's job a bit easier by permitting higher levels of out-of-band distortion products. The spectrum mass is expressed in decibels relative to the signal level at the band center, or in dBr. On April 1, 2009, the Wireless Gigabit Alliance was incorporated to develop specifications for audio, video, and data transmission in the millimeter wave frequency band operating in both line of sight and non line of sight environments. The WGA owned the trademark and brand YGIG to describe this technology. Version 1.0 of the YGIG Mac and Phi specification were published under the YGIG brand in February 2010, and this was followed by a version 1.1 in April 2011. A proposal based on the YGIG Mac and Phi version 1.0 specification was contributed to the IEEE 80211 Task Group AD as a complete proposal specification and was accepted as IEEE 80211 AD Draft 0 0.1 on May 20, 2010. The YGIG submission was not the first attempt at introducing high rate peer to peer communication to the 60 GHz spectrum. Wireless HD has the distinction of being the first technology to commercialize the 60 GHz space, but it has not yet seen substantial deployment. IEEE 802.15.3c endeavors to address a wide range of applications by having three distinct PHIs. It features a single carrier mode, high speed interface mode, and audiovisual mode, all of which are significantly architecturally different. The AV mode is exactly the same as the HRP Phi in Wireless HD, but the MAC layers are different between the two specifications. There is no known commercial development of this standard, perhaps because of its disjoint structure. ECMA 387 is also a collection of almost everything you would possibly want to do at 60 GHz, and probably as a consequence has also seen no commercial development. YGIG was the latest standardization initiative. It has been designed to address a wide range of use cases using both single carrier and OFDM PHI, but implemented with a much higher level of commonality across the two modes and enjoys support from multiple vendors. It has been adopted unchanged by IEEE on that basis for the YLAN 60 GHz MAC and PHI. This is a key point. The IEEE 802.11ad and YGIG MAC and PHI documents have been essentially identical from the start. In December 2011, Draft 5.0 of the specification was approved to proceed to its first sponsor ballot. It has since completed balloting and passed to the IEEE Review Committee in July 2012. In December of 2012, the Standards Board approved and released 802.11ad. As such, the Wi-Fi Alliance will now take the lead responsibility for certification and marketing of the standard. The first silicon was announced in the second half of 2012, and we anticipate the first certifications of IEEE 80211 AD compliant products in 2014. We have already spoken of the crushing demand for throughput and the congestion in spectrum in the lower bands. Let's take a look at this graphically. In the upper portion of this slide, you see the visual comparison of the 5 and 60 GHz bands. Note how much bandwidth might be utilized at higher frequencies. Recall, 802.11ac in the 5 GHz band theoretically can achieve 6.9 gigabits per second, while 802.11ad claims a top speed of 6.75 gigabits per second. One might question the spectral efficiency of 802.11ad. It uses more spectrum, certainly but it employs only 64 QAM and employs no MIMO. 
we have the spectrum at 60 gigahertz, whereas at 5 gigahertz, it is a much more precious resource. The 802.11ad phi layer uses RF burst transmissions that start with a synchronization preamble, followed by header and payload. The preamble is always single carrier, and the header and data use a single carrier no FDM modulation, depending on the target rate. The phi supports active antenna beam forming and steering. There may be multiple antennas, and the active antenna selection, gain, and directionality may be dynamically controlled. But the phi does not employ mathematical techniques, such as spatial multiplexing. The MAC layer augments the standard IEEE 80211 MAC with new capabilities that support the unique attributes of directional operation at 60 gigahertz. Here we can see the 802.11ad data rates compared with the remainder of 802.11. 802.11ad will deliver these rates by way of three variations on the phi, which we will learn about in the coming sections. So the question arises, what applications will 11ad address, particularly in comparison to 11ac? The highest data rate use cases over a short range will tend to dominate. Upload and download and docking and uncompressed and multiple video streaming rise to the top. But networking, particularly in concert with the lower 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands, will also exist. Wireless communication, in its simplest form, is nothing more than the replacement of what we currently enjoy in wired form thus liberating us from the bounds of the physical wires while remaining connected. We can imagine this as a big wireless pipe. Something has to go into the pipe and something has to come out. In the case of networking, it is the wireless implementation of gigabit ethernet. The situation is similar for other high-speed digital serial connections. All of these ride as payload applications upon the Mac and Phi of the communication system. Originally developed by the Wireless Gigabit Alliance privately, several protocol application layers, or PALs, have been defined in concert with the Alliance or consortium associated with that particular standard to ensure these transitions are transparent. The Wireless Display Extension PAL has been written to support both DisplayPort and HDMI connections, and a liaison has been established with Visa to facilitate the deployment of this technology as a wireless version of DisplayPort brand. HDMI branded cable replacement is based on wireless HD technology. The wireless bus extension has been written with PCI Express in mind, as has the wireless serial extension been written with USB 3.0 in mind. It's important to emphasize that while the groundwork has been done in the Wireless Gigabit Alliance to facilitate wireless versions of these established brands, whether they actually occur will depend on successful negotiations with the owners of these brands. In the middle is the YGIG Mac and Phi. This specification was developed privately by the Wireless Gigabit Alliance and was contributed to the public domain through the IEEE Task Group AD where it was adopted unchanged. Since then, the two organizations, YGIG and IEEE, have continued to evolve their respective specification documents in synchronism through the efforts of their common membership, so that today the YGIG MAC and PHI is essentially identical to the 802.11ad MAC and PHI. A formal agreement by the Wireless Gigabit Alliance and the Wi-Fi Alliance establishes that going forward, the Wi-Fi Alliance will facilitate the deployment of this technology under the Wi-Fi brand. As such, the Wi-Fi Alliance will be the certification body for 802.11ad, Mac, and Phi. Beyond the progress of the standards and merging of the alliances, commercial rollout has begun. Several chips exist and are now being developed into end-use products. Wi-Fi certification is expected in early 2014. Predictions of market penetration on Wi-Fi devices vary, one such being up to 20 billion devices in 2017, one billion of which might be 60 gigahertz. 
60 gigahertz is a developing ecosystem. Many of the necessary attributes are coming together in the form of a supply chain and certification process to set a standard for product interoperability and quality. China is seeking to deploy the same technology in the 43 gigahertz band to supplement its spectrum, and the emergence of tri-band chipsets for Wi-Fi and the merging of the two main industry alliances are significant developments. Wi-Fi already exists in cellular mobile devices, but the integration of Wi-Fi into the cellular customer experience, most notably for offloading, requires more scrutiny to maintain the quality of service we all have come to expect. Additionally, millimeter wave technologies are a hot area for backhaul, mostly to support exploding small cell topologies. In fact, this appears to be the hottest capital injection into 11AD. 11AD technology can be leveraged to support 60 gigahertz as well as seed other millimeter wave bands. An example of a tri-band chipset is the partnership of Wilocity with Qualcomm Atheros. Dell has announced that it will incorporate this chipset module into its Ultrabook, with one use case being wireless docking. eight hundred two eleven AD has its design challenges as well. First, it's millimeter. Twenty years ago, we worried about 5 gigahertz technologies. There were no fast ADCs and DACs, mismatch and skew were problems, antenna design at 5 gigahertz was a black art, and computation was ridiculously slow. Now, we can buy any of these chips very inexpensively. Fast forward to today, 60 gigahertz presents the same challenges of 20 years ago. We use IQ topologies to create an intermediate frequency. Antenna design at millimeter frequencies is not something everyone can do. Cable lengths at millimeter are critical. Picoseconds matter. But it's also better. These circuits are done in CMOS, which is really remarkable. Silicon germanium is also used for high power, mostly backhaul applications. And on-chip computation is very fast. Bandwidth can also be an issue. Wide bandwidth circuits are not trivial to execute on and require flatness corrections. A multi-element beam steering antenna shown here must be bonded directly to the RFIC to eliminate losses. This means there is no convenient connection. Over-the-air measurement can be achieved with a horn antenna, but lower signal levels and calibration remain challenging issues. We'll see how some of these impact the signals as we progress through an explanation and demonstration of the phi. This concludes the introduction of this IEEE 802.11ad tutorial. So with all that in mind, we'll move to the next section, the physical layer itself.